So good morning, everybody. How are we doing this morning? I hope we're all excited. We get to worship God this morning. I'm, I'm going to say on behalf of us, we're really excited to lead you. Um, today, you know, something about the message of God today is about faithfulness, it's about devotion. And, you know, as we sang that last song, God's amazing grace and unfailing love is always present. It's strong and it's there for us forever. So let's bow our heads in prayer and let's, talk, let's think about that, that faithfulness that God has for us. Lord, we thank you for who you are today and we thank you for the opportunity for us to gather together and worship you and just experience your presence in this place. We ask that you, the faithfulness that you showed us and your love and devotion, that we can reciprocate it back and we can give it back to you. We ask that you can just fall upon this place and just allow us to just see who you are and who you are all, all the time and just this, this, that you inhabit this worship and that we can have a great day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. chose me it's always been a mystery all my life i've been told i belong at the end of the line with all the other not quite with all the never get it right but it turns out they're the ones you were looking for all this time because i'm just a nobody trying to tell all about somebody who saved my soul ever since you 
stories of somebody in the Bible who didn't care about their reputation, didn't consider themselves someone who was great is Noah, right? Noah was one of those incredible dudes who, he, I mean, there's really nothing remarkable about him as an individual. What was so fascinating about Noah is that he didn't care about how people looked at him or, or what their opinions of him was. Noah simply only cared about pleasing God and obeying what he did. That's, it's a simple message that we hear all the time, but like, what does that actually mean? Have we ourselves decided that we don't care what our reputation is or we don't care how people look at us or think about us, what friends we lose, what family members don't really connect with us anymore because, you know, we, we, we think about all of that and how it's lost and we, lose, we can lose people and lose reputations, but, I mean, did you lose anything because you gained Jesus? I mean, you gained so much more. You didn't lose anything. You lo you, you lo it's like losing sand compared to gaining diamonds. It's pointless. It's incomparable how amazing he actually is. So let's take this time and this song to think about, you know, have I ever put myself out there on a limb and say, Jesus, I'm going to represent who you are and I'm not going to care what people think about me. I'm just going to do what you say regardless of the consequences. Thank 
myself Your love never fails or fades I build a boat in the desert place And when the blood in the water starts to rise Yeah, I'll ride the storm Cause I got you by my side With your wind and my sails Your love never fails or fades I build a boat Thank you guys so much for uh, leading us this morning. Didn't they do a great job this morning? Yeah. I get the privilege of hearing them every Sunday night, but uh, I forget that you guys don't get to hear them as much. So yeah, Jordan's in a little dance back there. Cause she, but I thought about emerging from the darkness like Nick did to talk, but I decided I would just come up the stairs like a normal person, Nick. Um, I'm just kidding. But uh, they did an amazing job. Uh, what I love, what I love about uh, watching. Uh, students uh, serve, whether it's through giving, uh, sharing us their gifts, whether it's dance or speaking or singing or playing an instrument that they've worked so hard to, to, to work towards mastering or, or whether it's uh, sharing love to uh, children on a mission trip, whatever it is, I love seeing them put their gifts to use because same thing whether you're a high school senior or an, ac an actual senior. If we don't use our gifts, we're, everyone else is missing out, right? The church misses out. If you have a gift and you're not using it, then we all miss out. You know, you're not giving your gifts for you. You're giving your gifts for the church body as a whole. And uh, thank you, uh, youth, for coming up and sharing with us your gifts and motivating us that may not be using our gifts as much to be able to use our gifts, whatever they may be. So uh, thank you guys so much for being here. Again, welcome. We're so glad that you're here. Um, again, just remember to check your bulletins. We got a lot of uh, exciting things happening this week. The schedule page is like full, full. So <laughs> a lot of amazing stuff going on. So please uh, look and see how you can uh, get involved and use those gifts. Uh, tonight at, at a student night, we're going to be opening up our signups for uh, Sold Out, our big uh, beach trip, our retreat. Um, so they're going to be able to sign up right there. We'll also be able to sign up online and through our church app. So uh, if you're going to be able to be able to sign in and pay and do all that kind of good stuff right there. But if you're like, that doesn't apply to me, uh, I'm not, I'm an actual senior. I'm not a high school senior. Um, it, or and you don't have a, a, a child in the student ministry. Um, we're going to need, you know, things have gone up. Things are a little more expensive this year. So we're going to need some more scholarships to be able to get as many people to go as possible because we believe life change happens on these trips where they can get away and focus just on Christ for a whole week. And so if you're saying, look, I don't, I'm not going, I don't have a relative who's going, but I really want a student to be able to go and hear about Jesus and grow in their faith uh, on this trip. Uh, come see me if you're interested in uh, presenting. A, I'm hold, you're holding up a piece of paper that I cannot see what it is. You're talking about the suppers? Oh, also, if your gift is cooking or just ordering takeout, um, we will take it on Sunday nights So, <laughs> uh, for the youth. So uh, if you would like to uh, share by just simply dropping dropping some food or staying and being able to serve it to them and spend time with them. Uh, please consider doing that. Uh, it takes not even an 
hour of your time, and it really makes a big impact. Because do you guys like to eat? Yeah. Connor, do you like to eat? Yeah. There we go. That's what I thought. All right. So, uh, so if that is something you're interested in, uh, please see Brandy. She takes care of the scheduling for me uh, for that, and she does a great job. So, all right, let's pray as we bless our offering. Dear Jesus, uh, thank you for this day. Thank you for allowing us to be here. Thank you that you've given us each gifts to share. Thank you for the students and their willingness to share their gifts. I pray that you all get, you give us all that same desire to share our gifts. I pray over this offering and that as we give, our, give monetarily that you would take it, that you would bless it, and that you would give us the wisdom on how to best reach as many people as possible with it. And I just thank you for, for this day and for all that you are. It's in your prayer. Amen. Book of Revelation is the last book of the Bible and has long inspired readers of this sacred text, from scholars to theologians to the average man and woman. It's a book full of signs and symbols that excite the imagination, but that require careful study to decipher the hidden meaning. Yet in the midst of the beasts, plagues, and horns, it's imperative that we find Jesus, for the book begins with these words, the revelation of Jesus Christ. John wrote the book of Revelation from the rocky island of Patmos, located about 50 miles southwest of Ephesus, or a four-hour boat ride today. It is believed that he was the last living apostle, with all the others having been martyred. He was summoned before Emperor Domitian, and tradition tells us he was thrown into a pot of boiling oil, but survived unscathed, and thus, as a last resort, he was banished to the island of Patmos. There, at the end of his life, close to the age of 100, he finally had time to write. Revelation contains several groups of sevens, seven trumpets, seven plagues and seals, but perhaps it's the first one mentioned, the seven churches, that is the most applicable to us today. These messages appear in chapters 2 and 3 of Revelation, but the names first appear in chapter 1, verse 11, where John is told to write and send it to the seven churches which are in Asia. Ephesus, Smyrna, Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, and Laodicea. These cities are located in what is modern-day Turkey, and this region would have played an important role in the development of Christianity. Two of Paul's missionary journeys were concentrated in this area. John's letters to the seven churches were written and sent to this area. And also Noah and Abraham both spent considerable time in what is modern day Turkey. When you consider the thriving state of the Christian church in the first century, you have to ask yourself the question, why these seven churches? There were other thriving centers such as Miletus and Colossae. One idea is that these cities were on an ancient Roman postal route. The cities are located in an upside-down horseshoe, beginning with Ephesus, which at the time would have been a coastal city. It could have been that instead of writing seven letters, one letter was written and it was taken to the seven churches and read in sequential order. But perhaps more significant is that these seven churches manifested characteristics that are evident in the Christian church throughout broad swaths of its history. The messages to the seven churches can be read three ways. Firstly, they were literal letters to those literal churches in the first century AD and would apply to the time they were written around 95 AD. Secondly, when you read the letters and the contents of them, the introduction, the affirmation, the rebuke, the counsel and the promise, they apply to the Christian church during different time periods over the last 2000 years. And thirdly, they can be read on a personal level, meaning even though we're living during the time period of Laodicea, I may be going through an Ephesus experience and the counsel, the promise and the rebuke to that church may apply to my personal spiritual life today. Each of the messages are structured in a specific way. They start off with an introduction of Jesus. They then move into an affirmation, then a rebuke, a warning, a counsel, and a promise. Two of the churches, Smyrna and Philadelphia, 
receive no rebuke. Two of the churches, Sardis and Laodicea, receive no affirmation. Each of the churches has a general pervading characteristic, be it lukewarm, faithful, dead, apostate, corrupt, persecuted, or loveless. Each one of these experiences can be ours at different chapters in our lives, and the antidote is always Jesus. I implore you that as you read through the book of Revelation, that you keep your eyes fixed on Jesus, the Alpha and Omega, the author and finisher of our faith. Well, thank you for being here today, and welcome to week two of our series on the book of Revelation. You asked for it. That's why we're talking about the end times in this book today. I love all those churches, and I apologize for the length of that. I know that was a little bit long, but I love seeing those locations. I love having the visual along with the church names and whatnot and what is going on there. Today it's a little bit of a longer service. I apologize for that as well. If you're trying to get out of here in 20 minutes and beat somebody to the buffet, it may take just a little bit longer. We have Holy Communion to close out the service today too. So take a good deep breath and relax and take it all in and enjoy. I hope that you have ears that can hear. Does everybody have ears in here that you can hear? I got a bunch of deaf folks looking at me. Three people raised their hands. Okay. It reminds me of a story I heard recently about little Johnny. We have not heard from little Johnny in a while. Hey, Mom, asked little Johnny, can you give me $20? Certainly not, she said. If you do, he went on, I'll tell you what Dad said to the maid when you were at the beauty shop. His mother's ears perked up. Grabbing her purse, she handed over the money. Well, what did he say? He said, hey, Marie. Make sure you wash my socks tomorrow. Some of you were thinking something different, weren't you? You thought that was going to go in a bad, bad direction. I know, it's corny. It's okay. It, it, it's all right. You didn't like that one at all, did you? None of you did. Okay. Oh, well, you win some, you lose some. In week one of our series on Revelations, we learned more about this book in the Bible, and we began a study on the letters of the churches. Uh, we hit a couple of the churches. If you want to go back, you can watch that on our social media or our church app. So let's jump in today and let's see. Last week it was Ephesus and Smyrna, and this week we're looking at Pergamum in chapter 2, verses 13 through 17. I know that you live in the city where Satan has his throne, yet you have remained loyal to me. You refused to deny me even when Antipas, my faithful witness, was martyred among you there in Satan's city. But I have a few complaints against you. You tolerate some among you whose teaching is like that of Balaam, who showed Balak how to trip up people of Israel. He taught them to sin by eating food offered to idols and by committing sexual sin. In a similar way, you have some Nicolaitans among you who follow the same teaching. Repent of your sin or I will come to you suddenly and fight against them with the sword of my mouth. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. To everyone who is victorious, I will give some of the manna that has been hidden away in heaven. And I will give to each one a white stone and on the stone will be engraved a new name that no one understands except the one who receives it and there's a few things we see in there we see one of the martyrs it's rare to have someone named Antipas was martyred there in this city that seems like a really tough place he, he labels it Satan's city and uh, they're being loyal and remaining loyal to Christ inside of this terrible terrible environment it seems like the the world today that we live in it's it's a, a terrible environment at times with our society and what they say and how they go against everything that this Bible stands for. And then, of course, asking if you have ears to hear. And do we have ears to hear the Word of God today? Will we receive what it says, even though we may disagree with it? We may not feel like in our society, in our context, that the words that were written thousands of years ago, we may feel like those words don't apply to us, but they do. And it's very clear, if we repent of our sin, if we repent of what we want to do and what the world would say to do and we follow what Jesus would tell us to do, that we will be blessed. We will overcome 
we will get to enjoy the manna. Have, have any of you ever thought about manna and what that might taste like? Well, we might actually get to taste that in heaven. It'll be an incredible meal at the marriage supper of the Lamb. And then it's interesting about a white stone with a new name that would be given to us, that you will know what that name is, but no one else may know. So your first point today is uh, out of this I want to focus on, repent of the sin of allowing false teaching in the church. That's what was written thousands of years ago here to this church in Pergamum. But we could see that written to us today in the United Methodist Church. Unfortunately, the United Methodist Church has been very guilty, particularly where homosexuality is concerned. They are promoting that as being okay, as it's something that is past what that was written to in that day that we've moved on, we've evolved from that, and I don't agree with that. I believe that the Bible tells us clearly that sin is sin and grace is grace, sexual sin of all types, not just picking on homosexual sin, S sexual relations between a man and a woman who are not married, that would be a sin as well. Adultery, if you have a marriage and you go outside of that marriage, that is sexual sin as well. And we have to stand up and say that. Now let me say this, I love everyone. I don't care what sin you may struggle with. I struggle with sin. You struggle with the sin, if you'll be honest. Everyone has a struggle. We have weaknesses. I have family members who are homosexual. I love them. I pray for them. I love everyone. I am not against anyone. Everyone is welcome here. We are a hospital, but I still have to speak the truth of the Word of God. The Word of God tells us to do certain things, and it tells us to not do other things. Amen. There is grace for everyone, but there is also truth, and we speak truth in love. Our society says if you like it, if it feels good, do it. Your society would tell you it doesn't matter. It's okay. Whatever you want to do, however you want to do it, but the Word of God is not that way. And the Word of God was not written to us to make life boring, to make life dull, to hurt us. The Word of God was given to us to protect us. If we will do what the Word in the Bible tells us that we can do in here and don't do what it tells us that we should not do, if we repent and we turn away from the sin that is listed in the Bible, that the Holy Spirit convicts us of as Christians in our heart, we will be blessed. We turn away from that and we become obedient to God. There are so many things in our society that I see today that just makes my skin crawl. It makes my blood boil. You've got this transgender story hour now that the world is trying to promote. They're trying to push that on children. They're trying to get the kids in in libraries to see this. They had a show in Knoxville, I believe, a month ago where they came in and they're trying to advertise that to get children to come in and they start changing the minds of the younger generation. Parents in here, raise your hand if you're a parent. Grandparents in here, raise your hand. Guess whose job it is to counteract what society is doing? our job. If you are a parent, if you're a grandparent, we need to know this. We need to understand this, and we need to speak that truth into our children and to our grandchildren, because I guarantee you the school systems are not going to preach truth overall. Society, the news, the media, social media is not going to speak truth. We have to stand upon the truth of the Word of God. We love everyone. We're for everybody. We want everybody to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, but we have to repent, and that's one of the first steps of becoming a follower and a disciple of Jesus Christ. Men are born men. Women are born women. You can't change that. It's biology. That's how God made us. He made Adam. He made Eve. So stop buying the lies of the enemy and stand upon the truth. Let's look at the, what John writes to the church in Thyatira, verses 19 through 29. I know all the things you do. I've seen your love, your faith, your service, and your patient endurance, and I can see your constant improvement in all these things. But I have this complaint against you. You are permitting that woman, that Jezebel, who calls herself a prophet, to lead my servants astray. She teaches them to commit sexual sin. We're seeing a theme here. We see how Satan likes to work in churches, how he tries to come in and twist things around to make it the opposite of what God 
created, and to eat food offered to idols. I gave her time to repent, but she does not want to turn away from her immorality. Therefore, I will throw her on a bed of suffering, and those who commit adultery with her will suffer greatly, unless they repent and turn away from her evil deeds. I will strike her children dead, then all the churches will know that I am the one who searches out the thoughts and intentions of every person. And I will give to each of you whatever you deserve. But I have a message for the rest of you in Thyatira who have not followed the false teaching or the deeper truths, as they call them, depths of Satan, actually. I will ask nothing more of you except that you hold tightly to what you have until I come. To all who are victorious, who obey me to the very end, to them I will give authority over all the nations. They will rule the nations with an iron rod and smash them like clay pots. They will have the same authority I received from my Father, and I will also give them the morning star. Anyone with ears to hear again must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the church. The enemy has been doing this for thousands of years. He is very good at twisting the words of God, just as he had the fruit there in the Garden of Eden with Adam and Eve. Did God really say? Did God really create man and woman? Is sex only to be between a married man and woman? Did God really state that? Isn't it okay if we do this or if we do that or we slant it this way? He's been doing that for thousands of years. He is good at lying and deceiving. This time it's adultery that's going on in the church. And he says, repent, turn away from that. But if you will hold on tightly, if you are following Christ, if you are obeying him, to the very end, I will give you authority over the nations. That's amazing. Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought about someday in eternity what we're going to be doing? We're going to touch on that a little bit in here today. Your second point is follow Jesus to the end, and he will reward you when he returns. We need to continue. I know we all start, hopefully everyone in here under the sound of my voice and watching online, you've made that decision, you've had that initial repentance where you've confessed your sin, you've asked forgiveness, you've turned away from the way you wanted to do things, you confessed with your mouth that Jesus is God, you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you've called upon the name of the Lord and you've begun to be saved. You have been justified but are walking out our sanctification. We are working out our own salvation with fear and trembling. None of us have arrived to perfection yet, as John Wesley would ask us to move toward. So we continue to follow Jesus to the end of our earth suits, or to the end when he comes back and he returns, and then we're in his presence. But we have things that we will do. Delegation of authority. If you've ever been in leadership, you've heard about that. If you've had any seminars or if you've been involved with training for leadership, you know that we can't do as much as one person than we can if we delegate what we can do to many other people. Let's see Revelation 5, 4 through 10. Then I began to weep bitterly because no one was found worthy to open the scroll and read it. But one of the 24 elders said to me, stop weeping. Look, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the heir to David's throne has won the victory. He is worthy to open the scroll and its seven seals. Then I saw a lamb that looked as if it had been slaughtered. But it was now standing between the throne and the four living beings. And among the 24 elders, he had seven horns and seven eyes, which represented the sevenfold spirit of God that is sent out into every part of the earth. He stepped forward and took the scroll from the right hand of the one sitting on the throne. And when he took the scroll, the four living beings and 24 elders fell down before the lamb. Each one had a harp and they held gold bowls filled with the incense, which are the prayers of God's people. And they sang a new song with these words, You are worthy to take the scroll and break its seals and open it. For you were slaughtered, and your blood has ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. And you have caused them to become a kingdom of priests for our God, and they will reign on the earth. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. We see that you are worthy, Jesus. Jesus was able to come in and do something that no one else in heaven could do but you have become a kingdom of priests if you are following Jesus Christ if you are a disciple then you are going to have that ability to reign on earth more verses in Revelation regarding ruling and authority chapter 20 verses 4 through 6 
Then I saw thrones, and the people sitting on them had been given the authority to judge. And I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their testimony about Jesus and for proclaiming the word of God. <coughs> they had not worshipped the beast or his statue, nor accepted his mark on their foreheads or their hands. They all came to life again, and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. The rest of the dead did not come back to life until the thousand years had ended. Blessed and holy are those who share in the first resurrection. For them the second death holds no power, but they will be priests of God and of Christ and will reign with him a thousand years. There's several things in there that I want you to see. I want you to understand that you will be <clears throat> able to reign with Christ, that we are going to be called to be with him as Christians. A thousand year millennial reign is what that's called. But there's other things in here that I want you to see also. And the souls of those that have been beheaded for their testimony. Man, do you have that kind of testimony about Jesus Christ? If the end times were to come upon us, if there's no rapture, which some people in here, I'm sure you believe there's a rapture. I, I sort of hope there is, but I don't see it in Scripture. I used to believe so, but the more I study, the less I see it. But if the seven-year tribulation began, would we have that testimony? Would you be bold? Could we be convicted of being Christians? If someone started to investigate your life, what would show up? What would speak against you in a court of law if you were brought to trial and your testimony was brought out about Jesus Christ? Would you be acquitted? Would you be let go? Or would your head be lopped off because they'd say, yes, he or she definitely, they are a follower of Christ. It's so interesting when it talks about in here about they did not take the mark on their hand or on their forehead. Interesting if you think about, man, I don't, I don't know that I believe all the Bible. I don't know that I understand how that could have all been written and how they could talk about these kinds of things and are those prophecies really going to happen? Well, you think about a mark on your hand or your forehead, uh, what was it, 30, 40 years ago maybe, they wouldn't have had the ability to do that. But now technology has caught up with Scripture, and they have the ability. You see these stories about them putting a little grain of rice. It's like a microchip under your hand, and you can go into the break room, and you can use the vending machine, not have to pull out any cash or a credit card, and you can scan into doors. There's all kinds of the ability to do that now in our lifetime, which there wasn't in the past. So that's just another little nugget of telling you, yeah, the, the Bible's accurate. The Bible is spot on, and these things, I believe, some people would believe, oh, this is poetry and the book of Revelation, and this is not literal, it's figurative, and there's all this and all these smarter people than me, but I see it as being prophesying. What's going to happen? That there's going to be an end time, that people are going to be martyred, whether there's a rapture or there's not a rapture. There are going to be believers that are going to be convicted because of their testimony for Jesus Christ, and they're going to lose their lives. It's right here in our Bible. It tells us clearly. But the great news is they'll be priests of God and Christ and will reign a thousand years, that they will not die a second time. That is the great news as believers. Do you have that assurance of eternal life? Because when we lay down these earth suits, as Christians, we really have nothing to fear. A lot of us may have fear of death and the process of dying, but when we go from this life into the eternal life with Christ, there's no more pain, there's no more suffering, there's no more heartache to be absent from the body is to be present with Christ. That's incredible hope for us as believers. And that's why we should want everyone we know to follow Jesus as well, to have that hope of eternal life. Regardless, Christians will die in the time of the Antichrist. He will have that opportunity to rule the world, but we will win either way. More evidence of us as Christians having authority. 1 Corinthians 6 Verses 1 through 3, when one of you has a dispute with another believer, how dare you file a lawsuit and ask a secular court to decide the matter instead of taking it to other believers? Don't you realize that someday we believers will judge the world? And since you are going to judge the world, can't you decide even these little things among yourselves? Don't you realize that we will judge angels? So you should surely be able to resolve ordinary disputes in this life. So if you ever think, should I take a fellow believer to court to sue them? Well, there's your answer, no. Work that out. Love one another. 
Because one of these days, the authority that we're going to have is going to be incredible. Did you know you're going to judge the world? You're going to be able to judge angels? That's a lot of responsibility, isn't it? A tremendous amount of responsibility. But we won't have the same sin nature hindering us right now that we have in these earth suits. We'll be walking with Christ. We'll have the ability. He'll give us the gifts, talents, and abilities to judge. Unfortunately, our legal system is not like that today, is it? We, if you've got money, if you've got power, you've got influence and political connections, you don't have the same legal system that you do if you're a poorer person, and that's unfortunate. But Jesus is coming back one day, and he's going to make it right. He's going to set things straight. There won't be any more injustice in this world. That's right. He writes to the church in Sardis in our next to last verses. Revelation 3, 1b through 6. I know all the things you do and that you have a reputation for being alive, but you are dead. Wake up, strengthen what little remains, for even what is left is almost dead. I find that your actions do not meet the requirements of my God. Go back to what you heard and believed at first. Hold to it firmly. Repent and turn to me again. If you don't wake up, I will come to you suddenly as unexpected as a thief. Yet there are some in the church in Sardis who have not soiled their clothes with evil. They will walk with me in white, for they are worthy. All who are victorious will be clothed in white. I will never erase their names from the book of life. But I will announce before my Father and his angels that they are mine. Anyone with ears to hear must listen to the Spirit and understand what he is saying to the churches. Most important final point or question is, is your name written in the book of life? We make many decisions in this earth suit while we're walking in the amount of time that God gives us on this planet. But you won't answer any other question that's more important than that one. Is your name written in the book of life, in the Lamb's book of life? Because when we pass, and there'll be a judgment, and for those that don't have their names written, who have not accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior, it's going to be a terrible judgment. It's a great white throne judgment. And then they're going to be found unworthy and cast into the lake of fire because we can't do it. We're not good enough. One sin would condemn us for eternity. But Jesus came, and he, he was... He allowed himself to be nailed to that cross as we're going to represent his body broken and the blood shed willingly for me and for you to give us that way for our names to be written in the book of life, to spend eternity with him. Most important decision. Have you made that decision today? One more scripture on the book of life. Philippians 4, 1 through 5. Now I appeal to Eudea and Senshi, please, because you belong to the Lord, settle your disagreement. And I ask you, my true partner, to help these two women, for they worked hard with me in telling others the good news. They worked along with Clement and the rest of my co-workers whose names are written in the book of life. Always be full of joy in the Lord. I say it again, rejoice. Let everyone see that you are considerate in all you do. Remember, the Lord is coming soon. I hope your name, I pray that your name is written in the book of life. Today, we're going to give you an opportunity, and it's going to be a different way of giving that invitation. In a moment, we're going to stand and we're going to partake in Holy Communion. And we practice an open communion here at Severeville First United Methodist Church. You don't have to be a member of our church. You don't have to be Methodist. We just want you to be welcome to come and partake in the bread and the juice, the wine. And I want to ask you in this opportunity, if you've never surrendered your life with emotions, if you've never asked forgiveness of your sins, if you've never confessed Jesus as Lord, that as you come through the line, as our ushers direct us through, that you would for the first time feel your heart strangely warmed as John Wesley had when he was reading and listening to the book of Romans. I believe that could happen as you come through and you partake in the bread and the wine, that you can see the symbolism of Jesus and his body broken and his blood shed, that you can make that decision in that moment, and you can have your name written in the Lamb's book of life. Before we partake in Holy Communion, I want to read from Luke chapter 22. 
Jesus said, I have been very eager to eat this Passover meal with you before my suffering begins. For I tell you now that I won't eat this meal again until its meaning is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took a cup of wine, he gave thanks to God for it, and he said, Take this and share it among yourselves, for I will not drink wine again until the kingdom of God has come. He took some bread, he gave thanks to God for it. Then he broke it in pieces and gave it to his disciples, saying, This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. After supper, he took another cup of wine and said, This cup is the new covenant between God and his people, an agreement confirmed with my blood, which is poured out as a sacrifice to you. Brent, I believe, is going to come. He's going to assist me in Holy Communion. Join me as we pray. Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity today that we get to celebrate what you did in sending Jesus Christ to die, to make a way for me, to make a way for all of us who will accept that free gift of salvation, that your body was broken for those that would receive it, that it would be healing if we would receive it, that the blood that you shed on the cross of Calvary is for the, the payment of our sins, that they're washed away as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered by you again. Father God, I just pray today that if there's one in here that doesn't know Jesus as Lord and Savior, that today their heart would be strangely warm, that they would understand how much you love them, that they would make a decision for Christ as they come through for the celebration of Holy Communion. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. At the front also, we have a basket for our Benevolence Fund. If you would like to give to that, that helps us help the community. We also have gluten-free bread. If you can indicate to me that you want that when you come through. It's the body of Christ broken for you, Brent. It's the blood of Christ shed for you. We also have a trash can as you go by. You can deposit your cups in. If everyone would stand, we start on this side and we'll come around. Come partake in Holy Communion. The table is open.
stand. Let's worship God now. If you need prayer for anything, physically, relationally, emotionally, spiritually, or financially, I will be at the front. It would be my honor to pray with you today. So please come. God been good to you today. I pray that he has. What about our youth today? Can we give them one more round? 
very, very proud of them. They do a tremendous job. They spend hours and hours and hours working and preparing to use their gifts, talents, and abilities to worship God. Join me as we pray. Father God, I just thank you. I thank you for all that you are. I thank you for the opportunity to worship you today in spirit and in truth, God, that we can speak truth and love, that the Holy Spirit will clean us up, that we will be moved to repent, that we're not going to try to fix anyone, but you fix and repair us daily. So go before us, make our path clear, make it straight. Let us have hands and feet that are motivated by the love of Jesus Christ to tell a lost and dying world the truth, but that truth in love and grace. I pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you. You're dismissed. This is amazing.